I hope you're all reasonably comfortable. It's a little bit crowded. Also, I was told that something in the speaker system isn't working quite all right today, so can you all hear? Barely? Keep reminding me if I talk too quietly so I keep up the volume. And do feel free to change your postures. There are people here who have never been to a talk. Uh, if you feel uncomfortable, change the posture of your legs and see if it is possible to do it quietly so there's a minimum of disturbance. There's always some noise if one cha changes the posture of one's <coughs> legs. It's inevitable. Don't worry about it. Also, since there are a number of new people, a few words about listening to a talk. The talk is not given for you to remember words, but try to, to see if you can look into yourself and find out the meaning of those words directly to see if this, well, what is said is so or isn't so. Because only then is a talk at all meaningful. It's not any authoritative statements that are being made, even though this is time and again interpreted this way. Question it with your total being. Verify. Find out whether this is so or not so in yourself so that you're free from authority. No need to follow anyone. The title of the koan we're going to talk about today is called Shakyamuni Holds Up a Flower. Shakyamuni, another name for the Buddha. And it's taken from a collection of koans called the Mumun Khan. The book in front of me is the is the work by Zenke Shibayama called Comments on the Mumon Khan. Using this particular translation, with another translation in the wings here in case we need it by Roshi Kaplow. This is how the Koran reads. There's also a commentary and a poem, all of which really lend themselves for a lot of uh, talking about commenting on, looking into. We may not even get done with it today. If not, you can come back after New Year's if you want to hear the end. <laughs> Long ago, when the world honored one was at Mount Irdrakuta, called a vulture peak in English, to give a talk, he held up a flower before the assemblage. At this all remained silent, the Venerable Kasho alone broke into a smile. The World Honored One said, I have the all-pervading true Dharma. Dharma is a Sanskrit word for truth or order. The incomparable Nirvana, exquisite teaching of formless form, it does not rely on letters and it is transmitted outside of scriptures, I now hand it to Mahakasho, to this one man there, this one person who had smiled. And the collector of these koans, who lived about the 11th century AD, a Chinese Zen teacher, Mumon by name, always makes a commentary on each koan and a poem. And this is his commentary on this incident. Buddha holding up a flower, one of the persons smiling, and the Buddha saying, I hand this, and he has many words for it, on to you. Mumon says, yellow-faced Gautama, Gautama is another name of the Buddha, 
Yellow-faced Gautama is certainly outrageous. He turns the noble into the lowly, sells dog flesh advertised as sheep's head. I thought there was something interesting in this. However, at that time, if everyone in the assemblage had smiled, to whom would the true Dharma have been handed? Or again, if Kasho had not smiled, would the true Dharma have been transmitted? If you say that the true Dharma can be transmitted, the true Dharma means truth, true teaching, but Dharma means truth, many translations for it. If you say that the true Dharma can be transmitted, the yellow-faced old man with his loud voice deceived the simple villagers. If you say it cannot be transmitted, then why was Kasho alone approved? And the poem says, A flower is held up, and the secret has been revealed. Kasho breaks into a smile. The whole assemblage is at a loss. This translation here, Varoshi Kaplow, <laughs> says, holding up a flower, the tail is revealed, T-A-I-L. Kashapa smiles, the monks don't know what to do. This koan can be talked about from many different aspects, but before, before going into that, Let's say something about the incident itself. I've read writings by many Buddhist scholars who say this incident has never been found recorded in any of the Sanskrit scriptures, which are the recordings, the written recordings of the Buddha's sayings and dialogues with monks, disciples, students, lay people. These recordings took place 300 years, about approximately 300 years after the Buddha had said them. Until then, they were just passed on by word of mouth. And even in this whole vast collection of Sanskrit writings, this incident is, cannot be found. It first surfaces in Chinese writings, collections of, of sayings of the Buddha or dialogues. So historians, scholars, are not sure whether it ever happened. It actually does not matter. If you're not historical-minded, it doesn't matter whether that happened or not. But if the focus of your interest is the historical line of transmission, then you may need to feel, get, fill gaps so that there is an uninterrupted chronological sequence. And this is what may have happened in this case, that this was invented to have an uninterrupted sequence of transmission or succession, whatever you wish to call it, right up to the Buddha. But this is not our particular interest here, whether or not this is historically so, but to look at, to enter into this story, into the scene, in which several things take place. An assemblage and a teacher about to or expected to give a talk, a sermon, and just holding up a flower, and one person smiling, and the Buddha saying, well, it's not verbatim because it isn't verbatim, 
I have the all-pervading truth, or true Dharma I, it's sometimes said, the all-pervading I of truth, the incomparable nirvana, exquisite teaching of formless form, it does not rely on letter letters, and is transmitted outside of scriptures. I now hand it to you, to Mahakashapa. So the question is, what, what is he handing over? What is transmission? Right? One hears so much about in Zen, mind to mind transmission. And what is a smile? which in this case seems to be sort of the criterion, so it appears the criterion of understanding the smile. No one else smiled. And Mumon, in his commentary, really deals with that very directly. <laughs> Holding up a flower. Was a flower handed on? Doesn't say so. Doesn't say that the Buddha now handed this flower to Kashapa. He held it up. So is this koan about a flower? That the flower is truth, nirvana, formless form? been times where Zen teachers have been asked, what is Buddha? And the answer was shit stick. Or flower hedge. Or buns. Dumplings. Does it mean that all of these have Buddha nature or are the truth? Is a flower the truth? How do you look at a flower? How does one look at anything? Flower, shit stick, human being, full of anger and resentment, aggressiveness, or sadness. Or joy. What is this seeing, this looking? Now, last question period on Thursday, one person mentioned, you always seem to say, accept your anger. You must accept this. She said, I can't accept it. You never say anything about going beyond it, just to accept it. What was asked at that moment was, who is the acceptor? Who sees the anger? Someone else later commented, and you always say, who is the acceptor? Why don't you say, who is the seer? We can also say, who is the seer? Who sees the flower? And, and test it out for yourself when you go for a walk or when you look at a person. You look at anything. What, what is this process of seeing? Is there a seer with, ready with critical remarks, which means I know something about this, I know, I know it better than you do, I have knowledge about this, and the person is that knowledge. Identified with it, it gives a feeling of existence, maybe of power, of meaning, significance or does one look at the flower thinking what does she want me to see in that 
What is there to see in that? I must be really stupid because I don't see anything. Uh, at this moment, a screen has gone down in the mind and one sees these thoughts. One's own image of stupidity, density, people call it. I'm so dense, I can't see anything. Can you see these thoughts that they come up? At this moment, that's the important thing to see. And how? Again, with criticism, I wish I was like this other person who seems to see everything, which is comparison with others. In all of these thinking processes, the flower remains invisible or just sort of dully, dimly percep perceptible. So what is a flower? If you don't know what it is, no intention to see something, to come to enlightenment in seeing the flower, because that's another thought, which can turn the mind, preoccupy it. Just not knowing. Free from this burden of what does he or she expect of me. An enormous burden we carry since earliest childhood. The burden of expectation of those eyes that look at us and the, the felt need to satisfy those expectations so as to satisfy one's own need for survival as such and such a person. Can that all come into awareness? Some of it is gross, most of it is very subtle. It really takes an intense, passionate wanting to understand oneself thoroughly beyond all ideas and images and illusions. So, holding up the flower and one person smiling. We'll come to the smile. No, maybe we'll deal with the smile first before we go on to the Buddha's commentary on the, on the event. This one person smiled. Actually, smile for the last few years has become very visual in these little tags we have all over, little round face, two little dots, and a line for nose, and then this big sort of melon-shaped smile from, the ears aren't even on it, but it's sort of from one ear to the other. And underneath it says, smile. On bumper stickers, in heavy traffic, smile. <laughs> Parents tell children who step into the door, into the room with a grumpy or preoccupied, sad, or moody face, why don't you smile? Maybe we were asked that when we were little. It can be devastating. And yet, depending on how lightly the parent says it, or whether there is a threat behind it, if you don't smile, I'm going to get very upset the child may learn to smile. Smile may be a vast cultural conditioning. One can say insults and receive insults and never the face remaining locked, the musculature of the face remaining locked in a smile. has learned to do that. So 
so as not to feel anguish, fear and terror or anger. Give this facade of smiling, which is approved by the parents, because it doesn't threaten the parents. Or teachers, or whoever. We're all children and parents. It's a very interesting article was sent to me from someone who lives in New York. It appeared in the New York Times on March 22, 1982, and written by a reporter who traveled through Cambodia after the uh, regime of terror and horror of Pol Pot, or is it Pot Pol? I don't know. We'll come to it. After that regime came to an end, after the invasion of the Vietnamese, I believe it was. And this reporter, it says here, D.T. Alman visited Cambodia in October for the Pacific News Service, of which he is East Coast editor. This is adapted from an article in Asia, a magazine. I thought I'd share this, parts of this article with you, if you want to read the whole thing, see some of the pictures. You may do so afterwards. There's one um, big statue talked about, and it is, the, the name is, let me practice it here, Jaya Varman. Jaya Varman. So whenever Jaya Varman is referred to, that was a king living some 750 years ago in Cambodia, who had this temple built, apparently. So it comes out from in between the lines, and his image in the image of Avalokiteshvara, of, of Bodhisattva Kanon, Bodhisattva of mercy and compassion. So the, the king, the likeness of the king, and yet as an image of a Kanon, Kuan Yin, Bodhisattva of, of, of compassion, which has often happened. Uh, I know of one other very beautiful uh, sculpture of Prajna Paramita, which came from Indonesia, from the temple in Borobudur. It was carved in the likeness of the then ruling queen. The article starts, how different from all the other sunrises in our journey across the heart of Cambodia is this culminating dawn of Jayavarman's smile. Oh, the article is headed, In Cambodia, That Smile. We have come to this last morning to the Bayon Temple because for us the road now can only lead backward. The temple's giant, giant silent stones are cool to the touch just before sunrise and covered in many places with slippery green fungus. The sunrise brings reason. What only a moment ago seemed nothing more than stone and slime is now a golden, shimmering human face. For three quarters of a millennium, that face, the face of Avalokiteshvara, Kadon, the Bodhisattva of Mercy, carved in the likeness of Jayavarman VII, has looked on all that human beings have done to themselves and each other and never ceases to smile. The face is a face of infinite wisdom, our guide is saying, repeating the words he kept alive in his mind during the years of slavery, madness, and death. The smile is a smile of infinite compassion. The eyes are eyes of... dot, dot, dot. The reporter goes on, beneath the face and smile and eyes, in the ba base reliefs of the Bayon Temple, below this giant face there, a little base relief scenes carved. The Khmer and Khums are fighting a naval battle. Khmer were apparently the, already the name of the inhabitants then at that time, and Khums were invaders. Someone has said th the scene has not changed in that area for a thousand years. There's been 
invading, conquering, defeat, and reconquering, and battle constantly. Beneath the face, the Khmer and Khums are fighting a naval battle while the Vietnamese and Americans and all the others wait in the wings. In one panel, a crocodile is devouring a wounded soldier. All around, heedless of this individual catastrophe, the much greater one unfolds. As the dawn creeps earthward, more and more of the Bayon, of the Bayon temple begins to shimmer. One face becomes two, ten scores of faces. Each face is a face of infinite wisdom, each smile a smile of infinite compassion. And the eyes, the eyes are blank, the eyes are oval stones. I walk back to the land cruiser. Our boy soldier is perched there, cradling his rifle. What would happen if the Khmer Rouge, this was this terrorist party at the time of this terrorist dictator, what would happen, says the reporter to himself, if the Khmer Rouge came for us out of the forest, as they still sometimes do? Would this child drop his rifle before he fled? And if he did, would I be able to pick it up? Even as the sunrise transforms the face of Jayavarman, so Cambodia has been working its changes on me. Along the road from Phnom Penh, for instance, we visited a village where the Khmer Rouge had killed 2,000 children. I asked several parents how many children they had lost. Suddenly everyone was communicating with us in a kind of sign language of death, holding up two, five, seven fingers. And since then it seems I am no longer a pacifist. If I had the chance, I would call, cut Pol Pot's throat with a piece of gro broken glass. But if I did that, I would cut my own hands. If I killed the killers, there would be one more killer in the world. In the end, the real horror of Cambodia was not the mountains of skulls. It was that the Cambodians had to be saved from themselves. Yet more astonishing in this land of mass murder was that so many still seemed to have some deep capacity, <coughs> some deep incapacity for rage, anger and violence, to be possessed of a gentleness that made the mystery even deeper. One Cambodian I met was a mechanic. His wife and all his children had been killed. Quote, the Khmer Rouge only spared me because I could fix engines, he explained. Now he lived in a more reliable world of pistons and axles, of devices that might break down but that would never go mad. Yet even as he spoke, he smiled. It was the smile of a human being who, no matter what evil has done to him, cannot return evil with evil. I saw that the same Cambodian smile, I saw that same Cambodian smile at Tuol Sleng, where the Khmer Rouge turned a school into a torture chamber. Many visitors are stunned most by a giant map of Cambodia, made entirely of skulls and other human remains found there. But another exhibit riveted my attention. When the prisoners were about to be killed, they would be manacled to the wall and in that instant before they were hacked or crushed to death, the Khmer Rouge photographed them. Many of the faces look out in unspeakable torment in that instant before they became one more of the skulls. But in a sizable number, the victim is smiling. The inmates of Tuol Sleng were forced to produce ceramic busts of Pol Pot. Every one of these effigies of their and their nation's murderer is smiling. Two. A few hours before our final visit to the Bayon temple, we were sitting up late with our Cambodian friends when I asked my question again. Who, who, where were the Khmer Rouge? 
they all had fled to the mountains of Thailand was always the answer, but of course that could not be. The director of the hotel answered. Like so many Cambodians, she had not just survived, she had survived with a wonderful gift, the gift of taking care of people. Why, I thought you knew, she replied. The Khmer Rouge are everywhere. Yesterday I saw the man who took my jewelry. The woman who made us work in the field lives about six miles from here. I asked her what she did when she saw them. I give them medicine for his children, she said. That woman is very poor now, so I gave her some cloth. Now the reporter himself is going through something that he's commenting on here. I felt an emotion that I almost, I almost had forgotten in Cambodia. Not pain, not anguish, but, but cold, unbridled anger. When they come back and kill you all, I said evenly, I will not care. This country wouldn't be a land of mass murderers if it weren't a land of willing victims. Damn your piety. Damn your Buddhism. You ought to be ashamed. The next morning, as an act of contrition, I gave her some talcum powder and a little kiss on the cheek. And when she smiled at me, it was a smile of infinite compassion. <laughs> the sunlight is growing coarser now. The face of Jaya Varman is still shimmering, but as the light spreads, <coughs> it illuminates too much. You can see the giant stones, thousands of them. You can sense the ordeal of endless labor it took to erect this man-made mountain to replicate this face of a single kin in king into infinity. The dawn begins with an image of serenity. The daylight reveals the compulsions of a megalomaniac. At Angkor, the Khmer Rouge beheaded the Buddhas, but they preserved the bas reliefs of crocodiles devouring men. They showed a certain reverence for the face of Jayavarman, for his cult of state power preserved in stone and slime, but built on the backs of those who were powerless when they lived and nameless when they died. I pull out two cigarettes and hand one to the soldier. He studies it, studies it a moment and smiles. The boy soldier is smiling at the cigarette the way the woman at the hotel smiled at me, the way the faces in the photographs at Tuol Song smiled at death. It occurs to me I have no excuse. I should have realized it years ago. Norodom Sihanouk, he was the then, before this regime, he was the prince of and ruler of Cambodia. Sihanouk had revealed it to me. He had been talking for hours. You realize, don't you, the prince suddenly said, all life is material illusion. The Khmer have been here so long, the soldier's face might be the face of Jaya Varman himself, smiling out of the world as he strikes the match and the flame leaps up. The driver has returned, the others are coming, the engine is running. From every direction the jungle is encroaching on the world of abandoned cities, of empty temples, of palaces, silent as stone. It is time to return if only we can find a way to nightmares of our own. Recall a Sashin when a note was written by a person who said, <coughs> wrote on that note, at one point during a round of sitting, all wrinkles seemed to leave this face, or something like that, meaning all tension, all images expectations, past training, to smile, to keep smiling or not to smile. Maybe this is what is talked about here. No, no wrinkles, but not meaning, you know, pulling your skin tight. No tension. 
no conflict. But not the facade of that. This is a comes out in this in this whole Cambodian scene. These people, who are these people? Uh, it's always so good to think they were imported from the outside. They come someplace from the direction of Russia. They are, they are ourselves. It's our own violence, suppressed, repressed, not acknowledged, not seen, ignored, capsuled away, which then at some instant or other erupts in, in that kind of... Uh, explosion of mass murder and whatever. So can can things be looked at in oneself? It takes this incredible passion to do this. Not self-concern, capsuled in self-concern, but to see what comes up in relationship, in reaction to what one reads, sees, talks about, is talked to about, and not to ignore anything. Not to hide a hurt behind a smile, but to feel the hurt. Not to give the appearance of invulnerability when all one is is one throbbing vulnerability. Not to look for smiles as evidence, it's there no evidence at all. One can learn them so easily. The smile of knowing, of, of having something that somebody else doesn't have. So one wonders what the smile was that Kashapa broke into. The words of the Buddha were, I have the all-pervading true Dharma I. All-pervading I means no division. N no division. Not just a little bit division here that I'll cling to. The rest I'll live in non-division. No division. All-pervading. Can't be all-pervadingness when there's attachment to something or other. That attachment which is based on the fear of no thing, aloneness, that attachment distorts vision. It blurs it. Because the main focus is the attachment, what one is attached to. So the all-pervading eye of true Dharma, of truth, Truth is that I. No matter what, what is seen, it's the seeing. This all-pervading seeing, which has no, no, no partiality, and no cut-upness, no all overpowering sense of me here as uh, an isolated. Uh, self-sufficient individual who has to prove himself or herself constantly to the family, to the society, to the business, to the church. That is the, the ground, the seed of all division, which ends or manifests itself in, in the things that we've just read about in this newspaper article. Or the subjugation of, of all that comes up, the, the self-effacement 
is the same kind of training as trying to be aggressive and uh, asserting oneself. Learning to either assert oneself or not assert oneself is this two sides of the same coin. It doesn't come out of seeing. Seeing what is there in a human mind, which is not a personal mind. Our personal, there's a personal history there, imprinted on the very last surface of it. But fear, attachment, violence, revenge, that is there everywhere. And it cannot be denied or repressed if, if it is then eruptions are inevitable. And you see they take place everywhere. When scans through history, they pop up everywhere, not just in one country. Incomparable nirvana, the Buddha goes on, incomparable nirvana. Nirvana is a Sanskrit word which means, literally translated, no wind, absence of wind. <laughs> and there's no wind, the ocean or the lake is still and clear and all of a sudden has this quality of reflection. Wind is all the thoughts that constantly move through the mind, waterfall through the mind. This movement from the past through the present to the future. You can see this for yourself. Don't just listen to, to words. See it in yourself. What is this process of thinking? It comes from past memories goes through present resolutions and intentions. I must change, become different, accomplish this, attain that. And then out of all this projects a future. The future is a thought projection, just as the, the past is thinking. And the present resolutions are also thinking. It's a whole stream of thinking, which is the wind. It arouses all of our emotions, feelings, which again arouse more thoughts, which again arouse more feelings. And here it is talked about having this incomparable <coughs> nirvana. The translation may be at fault. It's not, not a, a matter of having anything. Because who's the owner? There's no owner. The owner is the wind. The absence of the owner who has to have or has to get or has to become, the absence of all that is the absence of the wind. <clears throat> so, how can I get rid of this owner? That's the owner speaking. Do you see that? If you see that, can that seeing be absolutely without judgment? without acceptance or rejection, nothing. Then there, then there is nothing to have or to be had. Everything is there, as it is. Undistorted, undisturbed. Although there may be great disturbance that one is that, uh, that is being seen, but the seeing is not disturbed by the disturbance. <coughs> it just sees without any repression, because there is no repressor, no controller, no manipulator. That has been seen, that has come into awareness. And the awareness is clearing, freeing. The third descriptive term here is exquisite teaching of formless form. It's not a teaching. 
This cannot be taught. Because teacher, <coughs> teacher and taught are not two. And a day you have some time, you walk through the streets or through the woods, through a park. And you don't intend to get something out of it. Relaxation or fresh air or exercise. N nothing. Just walking. There's a breeze, there's fresh air, there's a rustling of trees, sunshine or snow, rain, mud, softness, grass, underfoot. Where do you start and where do you end? If there are no words to label all of these occurrences as has just happened here, you don't label anything. There's just walking and not knowing what this is or that. Putting all the words away. Then what is what? Or is it just, well, why put it into a new word? What is there? It is said here it does not rely on letters and is transmitted outside scriptures, letters and scriptures not being that which is being described. Letters and scriptures are letters and scriptures and they are usually taken literally, adhered to, memorized, recited and so forth. And that encloses, or does it? You must find out for yourself what you can see what these words point to directly and go beyond the words. I now hand it to Maha Kasho. It's a very confusing language. I hand it to you. Who's the I? Who's you? What is being handed? When there's clarity of seeing, and there's not you and me, and then nothing needs to be exchanged or passed on. There's nothing to pass on. Despite of our desire to have something to pass on or to receive, that's desire. Can that be seen? You work on who or moon to put it into that raw energy that comes up in the form of desiring, wanting, expecting, fearing, before it translates itself into lots of thoughts of what you want, what you're afraid of, what you expect. Just the raw stuff is who or moo, or the breath, without any word, no label, and don't just hear the words, can you do it? Or is there a doer who must, I must do this? Or is it just that? Commentary says yellow faced Gotama is certainly outrageous. 
he turns the noble into the lowly, sells dog flesh advertised as sheep's head. Is it outrageous that instead of giving a sermon or talk in a beautifully set form, <clears throat> just a flower is held up? Because Moomin says this tongue-in-cheek, obviously. Turning the noble into the lowly. What's the noble? Ask, one has to ask oneself, what, what does one come for when one comes to hear the talk, comes to the center? You may not put it in those words, coming for something noble. What does one come from? Find out for yourself. Ask yourself, what are you coming for? Inspiration beauty, discipline, form, whatever. Find out. And can you question why? This may be the direct line to something that hasn't been faced underneath. It may not be. You have to see. Here it says, turning the noble into the lowly. Instead of a talk, a dandelion. Whatever grows in the meadows of, on top of a mountain in India. A daisy or something. Selling dog flesh advertised as sheep said, I wonder whether the talk had been advertised. <laughs> I was told that sheep said was the delicacy, dog flesh was not. I thought there was something interesting in it. Somebody said that in the last Thursday question period, really in, a, in an honest looking and expressing, she said, it's so dry here. I thought there was something interesting here. Well, we do find human beings exceedingly interesting. We read about them in magazines, papers, um, psychological case histories. And it's all here. And here we don't find it interesting at all. And here we want to get away from it. And yet everything that's ever been written in a psychology book happens in you and me and is open to direct observation, direct looking and seeing, direct revelation. I don't have to go to any novel. However, Mumon goes on, at that time, if everyone in the assemblage had smiled, to whom would the Dharma have been handed? Is, that a, is there a problem in that? It depends on what the smile is, of course. If smiling is the criteria, well, then everybody would have been handed the Dharma who smiled. But is, is, is this the important thing in here that is one versus the many? That only one out of many can understand? This one may misunderstand it this way. Everybody else is stupid or dense inferior, has to wait still many lifetimes before their time will come. It's thinking, you know, this is thinking. It, it don't fall under the power of that. Or do you? Can you see it? 
if at the instant a flower is held up, everyone sees it. So what, what's the problem then? There's no problem in this, is in this anyways, even if nobody understands. It's no problem. Everything is there to be seen, touched, smelled. When oneself is not there, These arguments are being advanced here to, to see whether the mind gets befuddled by them, entangled in them, and then, of course, there is no clarity, or whether these arguments are just seen as what they are, trying to confuse or, or, or test whether the mind is subject to confusion, and confusion about what the transmission is, Because the whole incidents being in question, Buddha was once asked, uh, "Who is going to take over after you die?" It wasn't maybe in those words, and he said, "Whoever understands. You can be right next to me, and not understand, and can be a million miles away. And if there's <coughs> understanding, then there's no distance. There's no two." Mumon's poem says, a flower is held up and the secret has been revealed. In the other translation it says, the snake reveals its tail. There's always this feeling that there's a great big secret that some know, the initiates know, and the others are working hard to get a hold of. Holding up a flower, the secret is revealed. Because depending on the day, it's possible to see a flower completely, not be there, no problem, no division, just that. But then run into somebody who does one wrong, who treats one unfairly, talks badly about one, and then what? Defenses, the old defenses arise, aggression or whatever. Or is that the same clarity and openness to, to look and listen with which this flower was approached. Is it possible? Some people say it's impossible. It's humanly impossible because these reactions are there quicker than, than lightning, quicker than uh, whatever. But maybe there can be a moment of attention even before something like this happens. And then the reactions will not be quicker than lightning. They will cease at the instant of arising, because there's attention there and awareness. Not the intention to be attentive, that's an idea, a blind idea, but simple awareness. And that can set in, come into being at any instant in at any time. As a matter of fact, that instant is, is not in time. So there is never a lost cause, even though attention and awareness has no cause. 
can't bring it about by, by willpower, by any method what, whatsoever. And you say, well, what are we doing all this for? Sitting, observing the breathing, questioning a who amu. Do you want a goal that sounds inspiring? Or do you need to look what's happening this instant here, on the cushion, on the mat, on the, on the street? So one doesn't walk in sheer ignorance and darkness and blindness and does all the stupid and dangerous things that human beings do when there is no awareness. When division and separation takes the place of awareness in which there is no division. A flower is held up, the secret has been revealed. Kasho breaks into a smile. The whole assemblage is at a loss. In the other translation it says, the monks don't know what to do. Is this whole affair a matter of doing? Maybe that's the, a crucial state one comes to if one does not know what to do, if one is at a loss. Because then all the old mechanisms and techniques grind to a halt. They, they, they don't work. It's still the same old stuff. Then Maybe for the first time energy is gathered and not wasted in not doing, in not knowing, and yet not throwing the arms up in despair. That's doing. Drifting is doing. Not knowing is not doing. And, and that there's gathering of energy. So this is not he has the smile, he knows, and I'm again the loser. <laughs> Although this is how <coughs> our mind works. Why? Assemblage is, is at a loss. What is this loss? Loss of what? Loss of one's image of what is expected of one, what one should do. Is that a loss? Or is that what's in the way? We will end here for today. <clears throat>